When you come Christmas Eve, you expect you're going to hear the Christmas story. Uh, it's one uh, time of the year when you come and you kind of already know what the pastor is going to talk about. He's going to talk about the Christmas story. So as I read the Christmas story, kind of getting ready for tonight, I was impressed by something. Isn't it interesting that we all want to make sense out of our lives? When things happen, we want to fit them together in some way so that it makes some sense. We met because we were supposed to meet. Uh, we got engaged. We got married because, you know, that's what we were supposed to do. We had a baby. Uh, I got a job. Uh, we moved to Portland. It's all part of a plan. We use phrases that reinforce this idea that everything has a purpose. Everything happens for a reason. You ever said that to somebody? Has anybody ever said that to you? I wonder, are you sure? Everything? I mean, even though we can think of things that don't make sense, we want everything to fit into a purpose, right? I don't believe in coincidences. Ever heard somebody say that? What does that mean? There's a God, maybe a cosmic force, uh, I don't know. And so there aren't any coincidences. Everything fits together. When something doesn't work out, we hear somebody say, I guess it just wasn't meant to be. He wasn't the right guy. She wasn't the right gal. It wasn't the right job. It wasn't the right sport for you. How do we know that? Because there's something in you, there's something in me that makes us all want everything to make sense. It'll all work out. Have you ever said that? Or somebody said that to you? How do we know that? Based on what? It's part of our human nature that we want all things to somehow have a purpose. Then we have a hiccup in our lives. Tragedy strikes. We ask, why? What do you mean, why? We want to know why this happened. Divorce. Nobody plans for divorce. You lose your job. It couldn't happen to you. You were central in the company. They promised you. Now you're out. Sickness. You had big plans. Now you're counting your days. Or maybe you have an empty chair. There'll be an empty chair at your dinner table this Christmas. Somebody died. Or separated. Or moved out of town. Isn't it fascinating? Regardless of what you believe, maybe you're an atheist, maybe you're Jewish, maybe you're Muslim, maybe you're Christian. Regardless of what you believe, when you face something difficult, you find yourself hoping that there's some sort of purpose in your experience. We say, maybe you'll meet somebody else. You'll get better. You'll find another job. Or the conflict you're going through with someone will blow over. We want to help people through tough times. Because it's in you and it's in me to find purpose in all the stuff that happens to us. If you're a Christian, you believe there's a God. And he's a God of order who made this world with a purpose. He made you with a purpose. He put his image in each one of us. And that's why we want to make sense of things. You believe it's the image of God in us that causes us to want to make sense out of things. The Christmas story is a great example of God coming down into this world to show us in the midst of all the crazy stuff going on, he has a plan for the world. I'm going to read part of the Christmas story. Now, if you don't read the Bible much, 
I bet, I bet you were probably told at some point in your life, maybe by a college professor, that the Bible is not true. The writers just made up the stories. We've got Old Testament and New Testament. Old Testament is before Christ. New Testament is about Christ and after he came. But it doesn't matter. They're all fairy tales. I want to read one of the Christmas stories. This is by, written by Luke, one of the four writers. He was a doctor. He starts off, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, talking about Jesus, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. He says this was handed down by eyewitnesses. I interviewed eyewitnesses. Doesn't sound like a fairy tale, does it? With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. This doesn't sound like once upon a time in the city of Bethlehem or long, long ago in a planet far, far away. It doesn't appear to be check your brain at the door and just make believe sort of story, does it? So here he starts the Christmas story. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Mary and Joseph are engaged. How did Mary and Joseph meet? Well, they don't tell us, but we can imagine Maybe one day, Mary decided to go to the synagogue youth group with her friends, and this guy named Joe was up there speaking, talking about his faith, and they're trying to concentrate uh, on God, but they can't help but note that he's cute. <laughs> Afterwards, he comes over to their little group, and he's talking with them, and Mary notices he's a little older than her, and thinks maybe he might be interested in her, but... Probably not. Then she learns, oh my goodness, he's got a job. He makes furniture. I mean, the last guy she dated was unemployed. He still lived with his parents and he was addicted. This guy's got potential. She wonders, maybe, maybe he's interested in her, but uh, nah. Well, turns out he is. All that next week, he's thinking about Mary, and he gives his, his nerve up, and when the next week comes around, he puts in a couple extra squirts of cologne on, and after the, the meeting, uh, he asks her to go to coffee with him. And they go to the Nazareth coffee shop. <laughs> they spend some time that night, and then some more that week, and more time, and more time, and by the time he gives her a teddy bear, she knows that he's into her. She has no idea he's saving up his furniture money to plunk down on a ring. One afternoon, he takes her on a walk through a, 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 a grassy field alongside a brook, and he kneels down on, on one knee, and he says, Mary, will you marry me? Yes, yes, of course. They tell the parents and her mom and uh, begins planning the wedding with Mary. They start to plan their future. One day, Mary's by herself, and an angel of the Lord visits her. This is Luke again. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Are the words on the screen? Why don't you read with me? The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born, will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who has said to be unable to conceive is in her six months. 
Notice what the angel does. If you're not a believer, and you don't know what you believe about God, if he exists, or about Jesus, is, is Jesus really a historical character? Is Jesus really the Son of God? And what about other religions? One thing you can try is say, God, I don't know what I believe. But if you're real, and if Jesus really is your son, show me. I'm open. And if you convince me that he is your son, I promise you that I will put my faith in him and follow him. See, what the angel did is... He said to Mary, you know, you're probably having a hard time believing that you're really conceiving right now by the Holy Spirit and going to give birth in nine months. So tell you what, go to your cousin who is six months pregnant. She's way older than you, beyond the years of childbearing, and you'll see that she's six months. You see that, and then maybe you can believe that what I told you is true. And so that's what God may do with you. You say, I'm open, then watch. Watch for things to happen in your life. Where God is saying, see, I really am here. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary said. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Mary thinks to herself, I can't wait to tell Joe. So she runs off, she tells Joe, I'm pregnant. Now what do you think? Do you think Joseph is happy or upset? How many thinks he's happy? Raise your hand. How many thinks he's upset? Yeah. I mean, he's upset, and I can prove it to you. In Matthew, another one of the four writers of the Christmas story, he says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, in other words, sexually, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law... And yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph was a normal guy. And when Mary told him he was pregnant, he was thinking, come on, I'm not stupid. I know how babies are made. Who is the guy? I'll kill him. He was crushed. In one conversation, all his plans went down the drain. He's thinking, great, I already put down a non-refundable deposit on the Jerusalem Marriott. <laughs> the invitations, the wedding invitations have already gone out. Now what? He's thinking, this isn't what I planned. Mary's thinking much the same. My life is over. I'm pregnant. Joseph's left me. I'm going to be a divorced single mom in a culture where a divorced single mom can hardly get a job to support herself. This isn't what I planned. This may be where you are right now. You took a job. It seemed perfect. Then the company shifted. Downsized. And you're out of a job. You thought you were happily ever, you thought you were in a happily ever after marriage. Now happy is not there, and ever after is gone too. You thought you were in a good place financially where it was going to be a great Christmas with the kids. Then the car quit and the furnace stopped. You don't have any money for Christmas. Or you had big dreams for the future. Then your mate got sick. And now is gone. Maybe you didn't make the sports team at school. Or got a bad grade. You're thinking, this isn't what I planned, God. What are you doing? Here's what I want you to hear tonight. You don't have to know the plan to trust that God has a purpose. A lot of things have happened differently in my life than the way I planned. When Jory and I got married, I thought we'd have a couple kids. Three tops. Instead, we have nine. I mean, when we first got married, we didn't have a lot of money. We couldn't afford to go out to the theater. We couldn't even rent movies in. There wasn't that much to do at night, so we had kids. <laughs> 
Then Caesar Augustus issued a decree to take a census, and everyone had to go to their hometown to register. So in her ninth month of pregnancy, Mary had to go with Joseph on a 120-mile donkey ride. Last couple of miles, she's in labor. Joseph is so dead. He's dragging her as fast as he can. He says, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. Um, you know, I'm, we're almost there. Just <coughs> hang on, dear. Then they get to Bethlehem, and he's even deader. There's no hotel room. She's sitting on the dock. She says, you didn't make reservations? Come on. Where does she give birth? Ladies, in your dream place, in a dirty stall with farm animals. Then Joseph learns that Herod wants to kill the baby Jesus, so they flee to Egypt. They're hiding out in houses. Shh, don't tell anybody we're here. They're on the run. Mary's thinking, God, when I said I would do this, you didn't tell me about all this stuff. What's the point in all this? 30 years later, Mary, who said, Lord, I'm your servant. I'll do whatever you want, stood on a hill and watched her son be stripped, beaten, and crucified. Mary's thinking, Lord, you said he would reign forever. What are you doing? Yet just when things seemed terribly out of control, that was just when God was fulfilling his plan from the beginning of the world. He sent his son into the world. His son had to be born of a virgin. Couldn't be born of a human father or he would have a sin nature just like all the rest of us. He had to live a perfect, sinless life so that he could give his life as a sacrifice for all our sins. This is the hand of God on Christmas. We're reminded that just when th things seem to be out of control in our world, just when it seems like an unredeemable illness, an unredeemable death, an unredeemable situation in your marriage, an unredeemable job loss, an unredeemable conflict in your family with a sibling or a parent or a child, and there's nothing good that can come from what you're facing, that God has a purpose. Mary and Joseph had a plan, but God had a purpose. What was that purpose? The purpose was you. You were the reason Jesus came. You were the reason Jesus died on the cross. Mary and Joseph had a plan, but God had a purpose. His purpose was you. Jesus died for your sins and mine. So that if we accept Jesus' death for us, we can be restored to a right relationship with God. If you're someone who's had a change of plans and are dealing with something difficult, I want you to know you don't have to know the plan to trust that God has a purpose. A lot of things didn't make sense to Mary and Joseph, but God had a purpose. A lot of things may not, make, may not make sense in your life, but God has a purpose. And you can choose to trust Him tonight. We all want to make sense out of things that happen in our lives. Not all things to seem to fit a grand plan. You don't have to know the plan to trust that God has a purpose. If you're not sure what you believe about Jesus, about God, you have a choice. You can watch an, another nativity scene go by. Or you can say tonight, God, I trust that you have purpose in my life. I trust that Jesus is your son, or at least I'm open to considering it. And that you sent him to die for my sins. Thank you for doing that. I want you to forgive my sins, and I want you to come into my life. I want to give you a moment to do that in just a minute. So here's what I'd like to do as I end this message. For those of you who would say you've been handed something you weren't expecting, maybe it's a close relationship that just ended. Maybe it's a conflict in your marriage. 
Maybe it's bad news about your health or your child's health or your parents' health. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's a job lost. You're faced with something in your life and you don't know what to do with it. You can't see how this fits in with a larger plan. Why would everything go upside down in your, your work? You're not sure how you're going to get through it. So here's what I want to do. In just a minute, I'm going to close in prayer. And if you're carrying something that you don't know how to handle, that has you scared, in a minute I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Don't worry if people around you aren't raising their hands. Maybe three months ago they would have been raising their hands. Or maybe three months from now they would be raising their hands. But in any case, it's not going to matter. We're all going to have our heads bowed. So would you bow your heads with me? Every head bowed. Let's pray together. So if you're carrying something heavy tonight and don't know quite how you're going to get through it, would you just raise your hand nice and high and then you can put it down? Yes, I see those hands all over the place. You can put them down. Thanks. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray for everyone who raised their hand just now, took courage to do that. And they're facing something. There are probably others who didn't raise their hand that are facing something too, Lord. And so I pray that you would show them your grace. You are God of mercy. Your mercies are new every morning. And I pray that you'd show that compassion to them tonight, this week. They're facing something they're not sure how they're going to get through. They're looking to you. You're the only one who can deliver them. And so as they turn to you and they hold their hand up saying, God, I need your help. Would you help would you show them that you're real? And I want to say a prayer that hopefully will speak for everyone in the room. If anything I say speaks for you, would you just kind of whisper it along with me or repeat after me? Dear God, thank you for bringing me here tonight. Uh, God, I'm one of those that I don't know what I believe. I don't know if, if I believe in you. I don't know if I believe in your son, that Jesus is your son. But I want to tell you tonight, I'm open. Uh, if you show me that you're, you're real and that your son is real, I promise you right ahead of time that I will believe and put my faith in him. So show me. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, I'm ready. I, I've heard enough to know that I need God in my life and I believe Jesus is the son of God and he died on the cross for me. And so, Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive my sins. Thank you for dying for me. Would you come into my life tonight? Would you make me a new person? I've got some things that, you know, they're not right. I need help with. Would you come in and just kind of restore order and, and make me the kind of person I really want to be and that you want me to be? And God, I'll do what I have to do, my part. I'll maybe read the Bible more, pray more, come to church more. I, I'll take some steps to see that I grow in following you. Or maybe some of you tonight would say, I'm back. Your prayer is, God, I've committed my life to you in the past. No question, but I've drifted. And tonight I see that you really are the center of this universe and my relationship with you matters. And so I'm back and I too promise to do what I need to do to kind of brush up and maybe read the Bible more, pray more, come to church more, get back with you because that's what matters. So, Lord God, thank you for hearing all of our prayers. Again, I pray your mercy on those who are really struggling tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.